Well, um, welcome everybody to the Illuminate Public Lecture, um, which is about rheumatic heart disease in Indigenous Australians, and we'll hear much more about that in a moment. My name is David Salamaya. I'm Professor of Cardiology at Sydney University and the Clinical Director of the Heart Research Institute, who are running the lecture and the dinner later on for those of you who can join us later on tonight. Um, Minister Hazard, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Bo Rambaldini, the Director of the Post Centre. Bo Romeni, our distinguished speaker, from whom you'll hear more later. Sean Jackson, who's the head of the Heart Research Institute, and many other distinguished guests. A hearty welcome. Uh, so th the order of proceedings is that um, Bo Rambaldini will give us an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'll say a few words about the HRI and what we have done in the Indigenous health space, and just a little outline of the problem of the gap in cardiovascular disease in Indigenous Australians. And uh, then we'll hear from Bo giving her talk on rheumatic heart disease. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Rat Nation on whose lands we meet and honour their elders past and present. But to do a much better job of that, uh, Bo Rambaldini, who is the director of the Post Centre for Indigenous Health at, uh, at the University of Sydney, is going to give us an acknowledgement of her talk. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as David just said, my name is Bo Rambaldini. I uh, work in the, uh, the Post Centre for Indigenous Health uh, in the Sydney School of Medicine. Uh, and over there we do a, a range of things. The, uh, the, the Post Centre was set up by uh, Greg Poach. Uh, Greg, uh, Greg and his uh, dear friend Reg Richardson were very concerned about the, uh, the uh, plight of Aboriginal people and the health of Aboriginal people in New South Wales. And uh, Greg and uh, Reg sat down and uh, Greg said to Greg, he said, you know, we, uh, we should be doing something for Aboriginal people's health because Aboriginal people don't live as long as us. And uh, Greg said, why not? He said, because they just don't live as long as us. And they, their health is different because of their, uh, their, their, their lifestyle. So uh, Greg uh, contributed uh, $10 million to set up the Post Centre for Business Health here at Sydney University in the Sydney School of Medicine. And... Um, since then, we've been running a, a number of programs uh, that focus on um, healthy kids, healthy teeth, and healthy hearts. And uh, we're also concerned that given the, uh, the, the uh, way that uh, Aboriginal people are uh, experiencing problems with mental health, we're looking at uh, healthy minds as well. So I'd just like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the, uh, of the land that we're gathered here today who have this important lecture on rheumatic heart disease uh, from, from Bo. And um, the, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, it was upon their lands that this university was built. Uh, and we, uh, we pay our respects to elders past and present. And, and uh, for those who hold the memories and traditions and cultures and hopes of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Island people across this nation. We also like to extend that uh, the respect to our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters that are here with us today in this journey to understand exactly what, uh, what happened uh, and how it, 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 this uh, serious uh, disease of heart, uh, rheumatic heart disease impacts on Aboriginal people across New South Wales. And also, um, we'd like to say this lecture uh, will also work towards providing a bit of a round of breaking discoveries in heart research. So we understand that the more we know about these things, the better. And they're the sort of things that we do in the post centre. We do research, we do promotion, uh, we do prevention, and we also do some clinical work as well. The contribution that uh, Bo will uh, contribute uh, uh, this evening will uh, be a rewarding one. Uh, thank you for that, Bo. Uh, one that will lead to an enriched appreciation of the role uh, that women contribute to the research of cardiovascular uh, research in Australia. Heart disease is, uh, is the biggest single killer of uh, Australian women. In the last 10 years, heart disease has been responsible for deaths for over 100,000 women in Australia. It is the leading cause of death for women in Australia. Heart health is responsible for the death of more women than all the cancers combined. And, uh, and Aboriginal Australians are more likely, twi um, around twice as likely to be affected with heart disease. It, is, uh, it could not be more appropriate that uh, this lecture that uh, we're honouring uh, this afternoon, this evening, uh, the valuable contribution that women have in medical research in, um, in Australia. And uh, may I use our National Aboriginal Week uh, and ADOC uh, theme. And this year the, uh, the example is the important role, the contribution that, uh, that women have uh, in our world. 
and the support of her we can. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Bo. Um, so just before introducing Bo Romeni to you all, I just wanted to give a little context about Indigenous heart health. And it doesn't necessarily make for flash reading. Um, there are the main heart disease that we're all uh, susceptible to, which is the main focus of research at the Heart Research Institute, is coronary heart disease. And coronary heart disease, which is plaques of cholesterol in the main blood vessels to the heart, is a staggering 300% higher incidence in Indigenous Australians before the age of 65 years and is the single biggest numeric contribution, as Bo Rambaldini just told us, to the gap in life expectancy. And that's, it's hard to understand exactly why that might be and research into the causes of that is obviously important in redressing the imbalance, but it's due in part to the high prevalence of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, and importantly, reduced access to health care, and the Coast Centre is trying to address many of those aspects. Now, perhaps less well-known is, and hard, even harder to understand, congenital heart disease, which is the commonest congenital abnormality in the community, is 150% higher in Indigenous Australians, and uh, not such a source of national shame because it's probably not due to the same preventable causes, but nonetheless an important burden of disease. And Bo will be focusing on rheumatic heart disease, but suffice it to say that now, in 2018, this is a disease that is nearly unknown in non-Indigenous Australians, but of epidemic proportions in Indigenous Australians. And it leads to scarring of the heart valves, which in turn can lead to heart failure, arrhythmia, and sadly to premature death. And Australian researchers, as you will hear, have made major advances in the studies of heart health in Indigenous Australians. And I just wanted to show two examples of work that have come from the Heart Research Institute. One is a piece of work that I was involved with, with where we went, so much work now is international collaboration, as you all know. And this was a study where we went to Cambodia and Mozambique and we tried to detect rheumatic heart disease at its earliest preventable stage. And the way it's traditionally done is by a doctor with a stethoscope, and that's called clinical screening. But what we did in this study with colleagues from France especially was take a portable ultrasound machine that costs $9,000 and a healthcare worker who took four weeks to train. And we sent the ultrasound machine and the healthcare worker into the schools in rural Mozambique and Cambodia to try and detect more cases at a preclinical and preventable stage. And we found out that with this really simple mechanism, we could increase the case detection over tenfold. And of course, early detection is the key to prevention of the later disastrous stages. Now, of course, up at Prince Alfred Hospital, um, we treat the later stages and very effectively. And just so you know that if you get advanced rheumatic heart disease, there's still a lot that can be done for it, and we hope uh, desperate would be that not be the case, but there's this lovely procedure um, where if someone's got a narrow heart valve, and this was on a pregnant young Indigenous woman with a narrow heart valve who was very breathless during her pregnancy, you can insert a balloon through a catheter at the top of the leg, and you can pass it across the mitral valve, um, which is there on the ultrasound and there on the angiogram, and you simply inflate the balloon and you can see where the narrow valve is just about to be opened up by the balloon. And this is a 30-minute procedure which is highly effective in treating rheumatic heart disease in Aboriginal people. So there's a real bench-to-bedside flavour about what we're about to achieve. And I thought I'd, I'd show this slide in, in honour of Bo, the director of the Post Centre, because his background is in oral health. And he talked about healthy teeth and healthy hearts, but there's this quite amazing relationship between periodontal disease as a source of chronic inflammation and heart disease. And in this study that was done by Costas Capellas uh, in a collaboration between the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin and Sydney, what, um, what Costas was able to show is those people who have the worst teeth have the worst so in a linear fashion, those with the worst gum disease 
have worse heart disease, and perhaps even more excitingly, you can intervene in them. So if you treat periodontal disease, you can improve markers of cardiovascular health. Now, this is obviously a long game, and there are other ways to prevent heart health, but this rather unusual link between gum health and heart health, which is potentially reversible, is something that we're quite excited about. And again, I've got to pay tribute to the Darwin researchers who really carried out most of this research on young Indigenous Australians. So, with that background, it's my huge pleasure to introduce Bo Renetti. Um, Bo actually was born in Hungary and came to Australia as a young girl. And she did her medical degree in Queensland. And she is now a paediatric cardiologist, one of the first female paediatric cardiologists in Australia. And she chooses to live and work in Darwin because that's where her research work has been. But she's worked in Victoria, in Queensland. She's trained in New Zealand. Um, and her work in rheumatic heart disease is so seminal that when the World Heart Federation were choosing a specialist advisor for a World Heart Federation position paper on rheumatic heart disease, and they could have chosen anyone in the world, they chose Bo. Um, for this and many other contributions, Bo was named the Northern Territory Australian of the Year in January this year. So Bo is, an extra, I should be embarrassed by me saying this, but not as embarrassed as when I tell you that she was the 1994 Australian chess champion. So, Bo Rameni. Good evening, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation that is me today. And my today's talk will be on rheumatic heart disease as introduced by David Simon Jaya. So, uh, today is, we'll be talking about sliding door moments and rheumatic heart disease. And you well may know about sliding door moments. You may know less about rheumatic heart disease. So as David says that I was born in Hungary, and when I wanted to start this talk, I was sharing my own personal sliding door moment. So I was born in Hungary, and when I was about 12 years of age, my mother said, you know, would you like to go to a refugee camp? And I thought, you know, why not? But that's what we did. But my mother did consult me. She asked me and my sister if that's what we wanted to do. It was within consultation with her children. So it was a tough journey. We got here. And my second sliding door moment was after I finished medical school. For those of you who don't know me, I went to high school in Townsville. I went to high school in Townsville State High School, which has been known for many great things, including highest pregnancy rates and highest drug abuse rates. And that's how I got into medicine. So after I finished my medical, after three years in medical school at the University of Queensland, I got a scholarship do three years of rural and, remote, rural and remote work in exchange of being paid for my last three years of medical school. And the first place I got posted to was a place called Dumuji in rural and remote Queensland. And coming from Hungary, I had never been to an indigenous community. The things that I saw and the things that I found were completely different of what I experienced as a refugee coming to Australia. When I came to Australia, I was welcomed. I was given education. I spoke no English. I was taught how to, how to speak English. I was given housing. I was given food. And I went out to Dumuji as a first-year doctor. That's not what I saw. I saw indigenous children dying from rheumatic heart disease, preventable disease of poverty. So that was my sliding door moment on how my trajectory changed and what I did as a doctor. So there and then, I decided I wanted to be a children heart specialist doctor and stop, stop young children, and specifically a young woman dying from heart disease. So, you know, what's all this fuss about? 
why are we seeing these pictures in media in the last two, three days? Anyone who watches ABC? The reason is we st because we still have rheumatic heart disease in Australia, a preventable disease of poverty and social disadvantage. And to explain more about this condition, I would like to show you this short video. <laughs> do we have rheumatic heart disease in Australia? And the reason is because we have not translated the research findings that we found 40, 50, and 60 years ago to our indigenous communities. And how I feel about it, it doesn't matter. But I want to show you how the indigenous, feel up, indigenous people feel about this problem. Well, um, I didn't know about this um, rheumatic heart thing. Um, yeah, I didn't know anything about it. Brooklyn came into hospital two or three months ago now, and she came to hospital because she had the sore joints, the swollen joints. Um, and this is a condition they called rheumatic fever. Do you know anything about rheumatic fever? Not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. So many of the cases of rheumatic heart disease we see are in kids who've just gone too far, like they've ended <coughs> up with severe rheumatic heart disease, uh, they're in heart failure, <coughs> some of them have needed heart operations, and the tragedy of that is that it doesn't have to be. You can prevent rheumatic heart disease, and if you find it early, you can put kids on penicillin and you can stop them from getting to the point of being severe. To the extent that they never need a heart operation, they never need to die as a result of rheumatic heart disease. My uncle, um, he he died from rheumatic disease, rheumatic heart disease, and my other uncle died from it too, and my mum. He was a, a wonderful young girl, born completely normal heart. He died of an entirely preventable disease. I don't want to see other kids get rheumatic heart disease and they'll end up like me. 
in the cities back where I live in Sydney, no, no, no one's even heard about it. No, no, one, no one knows about it. I mean, there's some in the older generations that say, oh yeah, I remember it was a bit of a problem back in the 40s and 50s. Here was a disease that was fairly widespread in the mainstream community across the most populations. And now it is prevalent primarily amongst these small minority indigenous populations. To be honest, I think it's, you know, um, for the guys down in, in, like down in the south, they to come up and, and experience this stuff, sort of stuff up here, at the top end. Anti-government and whoever any government, we need to support heart disease or heart, traumatic heart disease, we need to support more. So we need the sponsors will be and to work together as a team. I don't want to take a stroke because I'm too young to die. Yeah. yeah, so that's a pretty serious illness, rheumatic heart disease. It starts from simple skin and throat infections and lead to autoimmune reactions that lead to premature death and open heart surgery in our young indigenous populations. But, you know, let's have a look at the history of this and see how we got here tonight. Why are we talking about this? So, back in the 19, 1947, um, and in fact predating that, the First World War, you know, we had some pretty serious issues with rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease as a result of strep, skin and throat infections became a problem. It became a problem in the USA, it became a problem in the UK, and it became a problem in Australia. But during those times, we had governments they were slightly different from our current government. They were engaged in war, and they had a parliament to address really serious issues. And the one of the first things they noticed is, yes, they were losing soldiers in the First World War, but they lost more people to rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease than to the war itself. So we look at a situation and meet more people dying of rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever than the actual World War. So the leadership was pretty strong around that time and facilitated some innovations. And one of the innovations, perhaps coincidentally, serendipitously, coming around that time, was the discovery of penicillin, which actually happened in the 1920s by Alexander Fleming. He was actually quite poorly spoken, and his research around rheumatic fever, um, around penicillin, was not a sliding door moment, it was a sliding window moment. He left his window open while he was brewing these plates, cultures, on his, in his laboratory. And he left the window open, and these fungi came through. You had the, the, the fungus had antibacterial properties that led to bacteriocidal activities, which meant it should stop and turn growing. So Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin and discovered the way to treat simple skin and throat infections. And what it led to is the decline of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, as you can see in this slide. Highlighted by the blue line. That was not enough. That was just simply not enough. The World War was going on. Soldiers were getting sick. Soldiers were lost. Not to the war itself, but to the war with the infections. And it was the Australians who stood up during that time. It was Lord Corey who stood up and made a research investment with his team to show that penicillin itself actually cures bacterial infections. So the first person who was treated with penicillin was in 1942 in the US. Previously, there was a previous example in Australia of a person who was treated with penicillin but they didn't have enough supplies. And in, in the US in 1942, there was one man who received enough penicillin to save that person's life, he was a policeman. 
But that was not enough because the Second World War was ongoing. And the U.S. was struggling with the loss of soldiers. But they were struggling with the loss of soldiers to infections rather than the war itself. So in 1943, there were only like about very small 4 million vials of penicillin available. A year later, they had 650 billion units of penicillin available. So this goes by a Scottish pharmacist. Research funding from Australia showing that this is the way to go and essentially contributed to the success of, this, of the World War. This is what research has to offer to people around the world. So you think that was pretty good, come up with penicillin? But then there was more to come. It was Christian Barnard who did the first heart transplant in 1967. So these are people dying from complete heart failure and now having an option, prolonging their life or having a heart transplant. And that was serendipitous. It was a lot of good fortune because his first heart transplant was successful. The person lived for about six weeks but then died. People criticized him if it was ethical or unethical to, put, uh, to, to allow a person to undergo such research. But because of Christian Barnard today, we have a program in Australia that allows for heart transplantation in patients who need it. But we have gone beyond that. In 1971, Mr. Fontan, a French cardiac surgeon, he came up with an operation that allowed babies that born with half a heart, not a full chamber, half a heart for congenital heart allow them, based on our recent findings from Australia, to live for 25 years or more after the operation. They're pretty powerful interventions and research findings that we have developed in Australia to make sure that people with heart disease live for a long time. So let's come back to rheumatic heart disease. You said it's a disease of poverty, highly preventable, could be easily prevented by penicillin. What's, but what's happening today? Today we have 33 million people living worldwide with this condition. In Australia, this is the distribution of patients we have. It's mainly indigenous, 94%, as represented by the pink bars. And the blue bars represent the non-indigenous population. And as you can see, most of the non-indigenous patients living with these conditions are living in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. A little bit like Kevin Rudd, a former prime minister who had rheumatic heart disease and had three open heart surgeries during his time in parliament. But today, the kids who are born with, who acquire rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, they're almost all indigenous. So what's the story in New South Wales? Well, New South Wales is an interesting one because in this state, less than half of the people with rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease are of indigenous Australian ancestry. And the other half are Pacific Islanders, New Zealand Maori, and other immigrants like myself who came into this country. Incidents are relatively low. The registry was only started a few years ago, three years ago, and it's probably a really, really strong underestimate of the burden of disease in New South Wales. And if any of you are in clinicians in this audience, that I would encourage that you call this number and let all your patients to the public health unit in New South Wales to make sure that your patients get represented and make sure that your patients get clinical appropriate clinical care. So let's go back to the step back, okay? So we have this problem, what are we going to do about this? What can we do to prevent rheumatic heart disease? And what, what, what would it take to stop new cases of rheumatic heart disease happening by 2030? What would it take? Every 
which country? Our oh, Australia. So let's go back to the Lancet because you need to compare your recommendations based on really strong evidence. Based on this Lancet paper, indigenous adolescents are 120 times more likely to develop rheumatic fever than non-indigenous counterparts. And if you just want to look at one marker, the best marker, looking at the outcomes from closing the gap, you could have all these different indicators. But you just want to have one marker to look at rates of rheumatic heart disease, and that would reflect how well you do in relation to closing the gap. The reason is, it doesn't matter where you look in the world. You can determine the level of social disadvantage by looking at the rates of rheumatic heart disease. So in Australia, we have higher rates than sub-Saharan Africa. We have higher rates than out any drought-stricken, warm-torn country. That's how we well we do social advantage in our indigenous population. So let's come up with four options. What could we do to solve this? We are all intelligent people sitting in this room. I want to do three. What can we do? So option one is have World War Three. Because we know that during war times, the cabinets, the war cabinets get activated and an amazing number of people get together to solve problems. And that's what we have right now. We need a war cabinet. During the war times, we came up with penicillin. We came up with open heart surgery. And soon after that, with heart transplants. So perhaps it is time for Australia to follow the footsteps of Rosenfeld and Churchill. So what's happening? You know, I'm, I'm sure you have all seen these closing the gap figures. And I'm, I live in the Northern Territory, so I'm going to share my journey, which is we ticked one box, and that, that one box was attaining, you know, finishing high school, which is great. It's great that the Northern Territory ticked the box, doing okay on closing the gap with finishing year four high school. But how did the Northern Territory achieve that without improving reading and numeracy skill or school attendance? Like seriously. But perhaps a civil war is more on the agenda. Yeah, so rheumatic fever rates, as graph demonstrates, is not going down, it's going up in Australia in indigenous populations. Yes, we do provide surgical programs for social issues. We have a surgical programs for most social issues in Australia. We have a surgical program for e health eye health, and for rheumatic heart disease. All of these problems are diseases of social disadvantage. And what we do today is provide a surgical solution for a social problem. And yes, Minister Ken Wyatt announced his roadmap in February in Darwin. I was at the meeting. And yes, it is really welcomed that finally, in 2018, a minister was brave enough to announce a roadmap for ending rheumatic heart disease in Australia. But my question to him is, is this like a replacement for the roadmap, I mean a street directory, maybe the NAFSAT? Is this NAFSAT going to get us there any faster than the street directory? Because if you've got a roadmap with no funding, that's not, gonna, not going to get us anywhere. This is Australia. First world country with kids dying from a preventable disease. So later on, after Ken Wyan's speech, there was a World Health Assembly in May 2018 in Geneva, hosted by the World Health Organization. It was led by New Zealand and it was led by Australia. And Australia, like New Zealanders, committed to ending rheumatic heart disease. And they committed to reporting back to the World Health Assembly in three years' time, in 2021, on how we have done. 
The death was like four months ago. I don't know what he had done in the last four months, but as far as I'm concerned, I've just signed more death certificates. So that was option one. You know, option one was a political war, World War Three, civil war. Option two is actually developing a vaccine. And I think it's a really good idea because if we did have a vaccine to prevent skin and throat infections, that would not only improve the lives of Australians, but would improve the lives of all the people in Africa, Asia, and in the Pacific. So if Australia was game enough to... Australia's already invested, but if Australia was game enough to invest even further more um, in relation to vaccine development, this would be the greatest gift that Australia could give to the entire world to prevent rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. There's a great group of Australians working on this. There's also a great group of Americans working on this. The journey is challenging. There's so many different strains. The vaccine combinations are not to be underestimated. And I think we certainly we should invest in this, not for the benefit of Australians, but for the benefit of the entire world, as Australians giving them a gift. Because as Australians, we should need a vaccine. We should be able to deal with underlying social determinants of health. So option, option three, and this is pretty straightforward. Rheumatic fever is caused by a germ called group A strep. It leads to throat infections, skin infections, and you give kids penicillin, and you can't get rheumatic fever. So why don't we just give every single child who's high risk a three to four week really painful injection between 5 to 15 years of age, and let's get those kids sorted. And imagine if it was your child. How would you feel about getting your child getting a painful injection for, you know, 15, 20 years of their life to prevent the need for open heart surgery? But it's certainly an option that we could do because it is still better than the alternative. So option four, I think, is the most sensible have a comprehensive approach in a rich country like Australia to solve rheumatic heart disease. The only thing we need is political will. As I've showed you before, the medical stuff was solved a long time ago. It's like pretty basic, penicillin. Housing is pretty basic. The US guys in the army barracks sorted it out. Um, after the rheumatic fever outbreak in the United States, they made sure there was a separation by two meters between one bed and the other bed to prevent the trans transmission of rheumatic fever and the strep germ. So the medical stuff, you know, it's, 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 it's 101. We do, we do need a political will. And what would that look like? It would, lo would look like this. It would lo look like improving housing condition, because this is the houses that my patients were sent back to after their $70,000 open heart surgery. And no surprise, when you return that to, to that home after your heart surgery, yet another one and another one. And why? Because you go back to an environment and you get strep again. So that's like housing. Next thing is, you know, we need to get some doctors out bush. And you think that's pretty simple, but I work out there and know it's not easy. We, we need to treat skin and throat infections. On any given day, 50% of all indigenous kids will have one of these infections that you will see in your picture, and it's normalized. So this is what indigenous skins look like, all those germs. Its treatment is penicillin that was discovered in the 1920s and was commercially available in 1940s. It's the medicine that saved the first, the Second World War, and we don't have this available and delivered in first Australians. We got guidelines and we got policies. Where I work in the Northern Territory, we got this lovely policy, but it's never implemented. That skin, the kids with these infections should be excluded from school until they are treated. So one thing is having policy. Next thing is delivering the policy in places where it matters. And delivering your policy to all Australians, not just those that live in big cities. Once you have rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, 
you do need this really painful long-term course of penicillin injections for minimum of 10 years. It must be delivered every 21 to 28 days, as depicted. And surprisingly, you know, our compliance are really good. Um, that picture only goes up to 2015. I got the latest data yesterday. We have 90% compliance in some of the communities. Of these really painful injections that kids need to have over a very long time. It means indigenous kids and indigenous families are engaging with health sector. So that's not the issue. And if you looked at Minister Wyatt's latest tweet from yesterday or today, shows that indigenous Australians have the highest rate of immunization across the country. So don't tell me that the reason why we have rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease is because indigenous patients are not willing to engage. That's not the reason. The reason is because we haven't delivered the health solutions to them to prevent rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. So we went out, you know, the other day in, in March this year, you know, Greta, um, did, we did exactly what David Solomon Jaya did 10 or 15 years ago in Africa. Like, you know, that's really late, even because David is an Australian. And we did that in Africa. We did that in Africa 15 years ago. So we did this in Australia in 2018. It's really important to understand how long it takes to translate research into clinical practice. So what we found in this community in Meningrida in Arnhem Land, that most people with rheumatic heart disease weren't previously detected, and went out to schools and scanned 450 kids with an ultrasound scan, we found that two kids needed immediate open heart surgery. It's a student from Melbourne, it's a the government paid for it. But, you know, they're 7,000 a pop. But their long-term journey is not guaranteed, it's just that they're saved for now. But if you want to make a difference to rheumatic heart disease, you want to make sure that indigenous people have equitable access to healthcare, screening is certainly one, one thing that you seriously need to consider. So you think, okay, yeah, 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 you know, screening, mm -hmm. yeah, we've seen stuff in Africa, other people have done some in, around the world, and you know, surely they are not too bad. So that's the rate of rheumatic heart disease across the world. But when we introduce Meningrida in Starland, it refers by is what you see. So indigenous Australians have the world's highest rates of rheumatic heart disease. We could have implemented screening at the time that David Solomon Jaya did this in Africa. But in Australia, it's still not on the agenda. So, you know, for summing up, there's four ways we can solve this problem. We can do start a war. You know, this war always comes from the innovations and technology, and that's what we need in remote Australia. We can invest purely in a vaccine as option two, and that would be great because that would be the greatest gift to the world. But in Australia, we don't need a group based drug vaccine. We need to solve the social determinants of health, housing, education, and so on. Alternatively, you can just put all kids on penicillin and then you wouldn't have to worry about rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease if every kid gets continuously on their penicillin. Rather painful if it's your own child. Alternatively, having a comple comprehensive approach to rheumatic heart disease, which is really thinking about the closing the gap refresh strategies. So I'm not sure what's in the refresh strategy for closing the gap. But if you just want to have one key performance indicator on how the closing the gap refresh is going, I would include rheumatic heart disease. So, my last slide is on a positive note. Some images from remote and indigenous Australia. <laughs> A community such as Madame Breda having possibly the highest rates in the world. This should not be happening. It starts at really young age. You know, some of them are just five years old and eight years old. And then it's a long treatment of, uh, up until the age of 35. Yeah. Um, and if they're not compliant with that, then there will be serious notifications. And to see an innocent child to have to go through that 
you know, knowing that that's their journey for the next two and a half decades is really sad. And if they don't stay on track with treatment, we potentially looking at very premature death. Everybody here realizes the seriousness and the gravity of this situation, and they welcome anyone. They welcomed us <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to, to work together to try to address this really serious issue. The positive programs and the positive changes that have happened in communities across the country have been specifically as a result of the community getting behind it and having Aboriginal uh, people from that community at the implementation stages of it. So today at the school, we're expecting to check every single school age child's heart to see if they've got rheumatic heart disease. The key to prevention is education. And the, the focus has been on children themselves translating the message into their own language and coming up with ideas of where the roadblocks are with regards to rheumatic heart disease control. Identifying that one of the roadblocks is hygiene, too many skin sores and not getting them treated. To become an echocardiographer, it's six years of university training. And the reality is that you can't get echocardiographers out into communities. So what we really try to do is um, simplify the concepts and make it available for general practitioners, for nurses, but perhaps most importantly for health workers. And that's what I love about Aboriginal health workers. They bring a wealth of knowledge that the skills that they have with language, with culture, with kinship systems and added to that their clinical training, you can't get that at a, in a university. It did motivate me to do more health work and now that I've done the training, I want to do more in health. So I would like the entire Australia to get behind this not to tolerate this anymore. The medical issue has been long solved and what we need now is political will and, and community leadership to put this disease in a history book. What is your sliding door moment? Today we sit here together um, hearing about this problem but surely as Australians, we can change the trajectory of these children who are currently suffering needlessly. And the way forward is community leadership, community engagement. But I do want to think about what you can do today, and I think you can write to your politicians, you can write, do your blogs, reply to media. But I don't think as Australians we can tolerate this anymore. And you know, I live in Darwin, but I know many of you will be a little bit upset about what's happening in Nauru and children in detention and all that, all that kind of stuff. So I just want to share my personal story with you with Nauru. As a pediatric cardiologist, I worked in Nauru and I served the local population of Nauru. Not the rest of the world, not the Vietnamese. But what I can tell you I also experienced what, happen, what happens to the detainees in Nauru. And the conditions that they live in is far superior to what our Indigenous Australians live in far North Queensland. So kids in Nauru have better access to education, healthcare and housing than our Australian Indigenous kids in far North Queensland. Northern Territory. I just want to get that very clear. If any of, you, if any of you are activists and you care about refugees as children, I'm telling you that the problem in Indigenous Australia is much bigger than the problem in our room in relation to healthcare, education, mental health suicide or rheumatic heart disease. And finally, you know, like Manning Rito is a pretty cool place to hang out, remote Australia. And these guys not they have many Rito people in Australia they don't have resignation syndrome. They got a syndrome of getting behind this and doing things in a positive way. And I just want to show you what the community has done in East Tarnum land to address rheumatic heart disease, and this is my final slide.
woke up in the morning and I was dizzy in my head, shaking and sweating in my bed. Couldn't go to school, I was short of breath. I went to the clinic to get it checked. Doctor plane threw me straight to Darwin. And this is where my treatment started. Rheumatic heart caused all the pain. And now I need a needle every 28 days. This story begins from the start. So throat, so skin, pain in your heart. If you're feeling weak, throat and pain. Go to the clinic, don't be shame. The script girls is the start. This could be dramatic heart. Listen up, family, it's time to learn. We can stop disease by stopping the drugs. Simple injection to stop the infection. Push tough medicine, simple prevention. Once you got it, you gotta be brave. Get your injection every 28 days. If you were to bed like 229, it can damage your heart, it can ruin your life. All my family, listen up, please. RHD, prevent the disease. Don't wanna live each day. And another 28. Thank you. This lecture, this lecture series is called Illuminate, which is shining a light where a light hasn't previously existed. I think you'll agree with me this was one of the most illuminating things for all Australians.